chapter number 8 once again we'll remain standing for the uh, public reading of the word of God we'll read our text and we'll pray and see what the Lord has for our understanding this evening we we're talking this morning about the Holy Spirit and uh, learned a little bit more about just who the Holy Spirit is uh, tonight I'd like for us just to continue with that and think about what the Holy Spirit does, what the Holy Spirit does for us. The same text, Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse number 14, as the Apostle Paul would write, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also uh, glorified together. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for the reading of the word of God once again this evening. And we ask now that you would speak to our hearts and draw us closer to yourself. Teach us, equip us, that we might be able to serve you better. We well, thank you for all you do. We pray again for souls to be saved and lives to be changed and for revival to come. And we well, thank you for what you do in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing for the Word of God. We talk about the Holy Spirit. And this morning in thinking about just who the Holy Spirit is and how important it is that we as Christians have a good understanding of the Holy Spirit. For one thing, and I think one thing that stands out especially is the fact that we cannot really be witnesses for Christ uh, without the Holy Spirit. As Jesus told his disciples in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea, and, 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 and unto Samaria and, 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 uh, and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now Jesus is telling his disciples early on there in the book of Acts, this is just before he ascended back to heaven. Uh, they would be left on their own. He told them to tarry in Jerusalem till they'd be endued with power from on high. That power from on high was the coming of the Holy Spirit. And it was the Holy Spirit that enabled them to be the witnesses that they were gave them boldness and gave them power and, and, uh, and, and gave them what they needed to know to, and the things to say to be witnesses for him. Same thing is true for us. We cannot really be a witness without the Holy Spirit. And, and we learn that the Holy Spirit is equal to God. Verse 14, verse 15 again, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Uh, it's the, the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is equal to God. And three reasons, because he is personal, because he is powerful, and because he is the principal of the church. He is the leader of the church, and we greatly depend upon the leadership of the Holy Spirit, amen, in the church. And so that's really who the Holy Spirit is. But let's think tonight about what the Holy Spirit does. I want us to begin the first point, just to point out something in verse number 14, uh, once again, where it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And, and, and the thing we ought to remind ourselves with is really what we finished the message this morning, and that is how that the Holy Spirit gives evidence that we are saved. 
Remember, that's one of the things we learned about the Holy Spirit, that, that he gives the evidence of salvation. And he gives us evidence that we're saved. It says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, and it says, they are the sons of God. And notice how he does this. First of all, the Holy Spirit bears witness of the believer. He bears witness of the believer. Drop down to verse number 16. And in verse number 16, notice how it says, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now notice that phrase that we are the children of God. And in verse number 14, that they are the sons of God. And so this is talking about being saved. Amen. It's talking about being a child of God, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, a believer. It's talking about those who have salvation, those who are saved. Those who are saved are led by the Spirit. Uh, those, those who are saved, uh, the Spirit bears witness to the truth that the individual, that, that person is saved. And so the Holy Spirit bears witness of the believer according to verse number 16. That phrase there, beareth witness, uh, it means that it testifies together. When it says the Spirit uh, beareth witness with our spirit. The Spirit of God testifies together with our spirit. Another way of saying it is that he agrees with our spirit. And he, he, it's, a, it's an assurance that we have. You say amen to that. It's, it's an assuring us that, we've saved, that we're saved. The Holy Spirit does that. Philippians chapter 4 verse 7 I think tells us really a uh, wonderful thing that God gives us uh, that's really what this assurance from the Holy Spirit and this bearing witness of the Holy Spirit really is all about. Philippians chapter 4 verse 7 says this, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, the peace of God. Now it says it passeth all understanding, and so that is the world doesn't understand it. And, and we could say it like this, those who do not have it don't understand it. Amen. They, they don't understand it. They don't understand the kind of confidence and the kind of assurance that a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, can have. Remember to really have the Holy Spirit and to know the Holy Spirit, to know God and to know Jesus, you have to be born again. Amen. Jesus said in John chapter 3, you must be born again. You have to be born of the Spirit of God. Uh, we have to have a spiritual new birth, a spiritual rebirth uh, to have the promise of salvation, the promise of everlasting life. And so you see, those who actually don't have that, then they're not going to be able to comprehend or understand such things as the peace of God. Uh, we've said how that uh, one of the things about it, you have to have the Holy Spirit to be able to understand the things of God. The things of God have to be understood on a spiritual basis. And someone without the Holy Spirit uh, is, is not spiritual and so is not able to understand spiritual things. And someone without the Holy Spirit would not have this peace of God. And by the way, if you don't have the peace of God, then, then there's, there's not that bearing of witness with you that you are a child of God, that you've got confidence you know, one of the greatest things that, that you can have is that full assurance and confidence that you could look anybody in the face and you could say, look, I know that if I die today, I will be in heaven. If I die today, I will be in heaven. Not because of anything that I've done, but because I know about the time when I trusted Christ as my Savior. And I believe the gospel. And I know how the Spirit of God has come in and has changed me from the inside out. Don't ask me how to explain it. It passeth all understanding, but God has given me a peace, amen, an assurance and a confidence. That's that witness of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Let, let me say this about the, uh, about the peace of God. The peace of God is something that absolutely cannot be manufactured. Can you say amen to that? It cannot be manufactured. Now, it could be faked. There are many that could fake it, and uh, there are false uh, professions 
uh, many people that would make a false profession in the Lord Jesus Christ. They say, yes, uh, I've been saved, or yes, that I'm a Christian, when they really don't know the Lord. Remember in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus talked about those that would say to him uh, on one occasion, uh, Lord, Lord, we've done all these things, but yet Jesus said, I never knew you. And so there are the, the peace of God could be faked, but it cannot, now watch this, it cannot be produced by our own making. It's not something that you and I can just, can just conjure up. It's not something you and I can just build up. It's not something that you can go to a class and you can get the diploma on and you can have the peace of God. Why? Because it is beyond the natural. It, it, it passeth all understanding. In other words, it is a supernatural thing. Amen. The peace of God. And the only way you can have a supernatural thing is to have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to do that for you. Uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 once again. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I'm going to go ahead and begin reading with verse 4 and read several, or, or verse number 1 rather. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 1 and several verses here. Uh, the, the Bible says, verse, uh, verse 1, And I, brethren, the Apostle Paul writing here, I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. Demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come uh, to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him, but God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of the man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? And even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, uh, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, that be the unsaved man, the natural man or the unsaved man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto them. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually uh, discerned. And you see that is the very reason why the peace of God that can only be had when the, pre when the Holy Spirit is present the peace of God, the Bible says, passeth all understanding. Those that don't have it can't understand it. Uh, those that are not saved can't understand it. And those that are unsaved can't know the spiritual things of God because they must be known spiritually. And here's the thing. You can't know spiritual things unless you have the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we, we have that peace that passes the understanding. And, and we can understand. doesn't mean that we absolutely are well able to interpret the Bible in every way, in every uh, letter, or that we've got tremendous confidence that we know more about the Bible than anybody else. It's not talking about that at all, but it's talking about a, a confidence and assurance that we have within ourselves. We don't claim to know everything, but we do have full assurance that we know the one who does know everything. Amen. Our confidence is in Him. Our peace is in Him. Our peace is not in ourselves, but our peace is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, it's the Holy Spirit that gives us that witness, that gives us that assurance and that peace and that confidence. And so the Holy Spirit bears witness uh, of the believer in verse 16. And then also uh, another evidence that we are saved and how the Holy Spirit gives evidence that we're saved the Holy Spirit indwells the believer. The Holy Spirit indwells the believer. Let, let's back up in Romans chapter 8. 
And back up to verse number 5. And in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 5, and read down through verse number 9, where, where the Bible says, For they that are, are, of, are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed uh, can be. Now why is it that he would say that the carnal mind, or the fleshly mind, the worldly mind, you could use those terms as well, uh, why is it uh, that it would be uh, uh, death, that it would be enmity against God, why would it be that it's not subject to the uh, law of God? It's because the Holy Spirit is not there, you see. The Holy Spirit is not there giving that evidence of salvation. So then, verse 8, they that are in the flesh cannot please God because they don't have the Spirit. Verse 9, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Do you see that? Dwell in you. And then he says, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, uh, he is none of his. And so another way that the Holy Spirit uh, it gives evidence that you're saved is the fact that, that, that the Holy Spirit indwells in your life. And the Holy Spirit does indwell in your life when you've trusted Christ as your Savior. When you've been born again, He indwells in your life. Let's look at John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and pick up reading with verse number 16. Here Jesus talks about sending the Holy Spirit about the about the Comforter, about the Holy Spirit coming uh, to, to his disciples. In John 14, verse 16, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. And watch the words, For he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world uh, seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. How is it that you and I today can really see the Lord Jesus Christ? We can see the Lord Jesus Christ by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit, understand this. The Holy Spirit does not replace Jesus. We need to get our thinking right on that. The Holy Spirit does not replace Jesus. Jesus is our Savior. Can you say amen to that? Jesus is the reason we can be saved. Jesus died on the cross as a substitute and a sacrifice and the payment for our sins and the propitiation of our sins towards the wrath of God so that we can be justified in God's sight and have the promise of everlasting life. Jesus took our place on the cross and Jesus is our Savior. The Holy Spirit is not meant to take His place, you see. But the Holy Spirit is meant to reveal Him to us and to make Him real uh, to the believer. As a believer, Jesus Christ lives in you through the person of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. It says, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? How is it that Jesus Christ can actually be in you, can actually be in me? He, he indwells us by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that indwells the believer. And when you, when you have the indwelling Holy Spirit, it's evidence of salvation. The Holy Spirit bearing witness with our spirit, as it said in verse number, uh, verse number 16, that we are the children of God. And so the Spirit of God indwells us. And in and, and, and Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, it said it like this, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so he's not a replacement, but he is the one that makes Jesus real in our hearts and in our lives. Amen. The Spirit of God makes Jesus real within us. And so you have the evidence that we're saved. That's what the Holy Spirit uh, does for us bears witness uh, of the believer, indwells the believer. But then here's something else the Holy Spirit does also. 
Not only does he give evidence uh, that we're saved, but he empowers us for holy living. He, em he empowers us for holy living. Go back to the be beginning of Romans chapter 8 and, pick up, and, and start with verse 1, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Notice, uh, if we're walking after the Spirit, not after the flesh, uh, there's no condemnation to all who are, who are in Christ Jesus. We're, in other words, we live our lives by that indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, by Jesus Christ living within us. And so we have to have that in order to live a holy life that it would be pleasing uh, to the Lord. And, and no, notice how in verse 4 again that says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. It fulfilled in us. God's righteousness fulfilled in us. Not because of our flesh, but because of the Spirit that we walk and live after the Spirit of God. In other words, if, you are, if we are going to be witnesses and be right with God, we must be empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's where we get our strength. That's where we get our power uh, to live for the Lord. In ourselves, we cannot live righteously and holy before God. We need to recognize that and say amen to that. In and of ourselves, we have absolutely nothing of our own selves that we could be really pleasing to the Lord that we can live a life of righteousness and holiness. If we are to have any success in living the Christian life, then our lives must reflect a quality of holiness. There has to be that separation. There has to be that holiness about us. People need to be able to see the difference that Jesus actually makes in our lives by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Amen. They need to be able to see that. Well, the Spirit of God is where we get the help for that where we get the empowerment to live the Christian life. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter number 1 and uh, verse 13, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 13 uh, and following, Wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is uh, to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, now watch this, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. In other words, don't keep living like the way you used to live before you came to know Christ. Uh, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversations, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. You see, God expects His children to live holy lives. He expects us to live different than the way we used to live. And He expects us to live differently from others in the world that don't know uh, the Lord as their Savior. Amen. And don't have that indwelling Holy Spirit. Well, how do we do that? After all, we're flesh. And I would suppose every single one of us under the sound of my voice tonight and every one of us in this building tonight would have to confess that there are times in our lives, perhaps even multiple times, where we would have to confess that we failed God in our in ourself trying to live in, in a holy and a righteous fashion, that we have slipped up, we have our faults, we have our, our problems and our trials, and, and oftentimes we do fail the Lord. But still, God's design upon our lives is that we're to live holy lives. And the help that we can get in order to do that comes from the Holy Spirit. And people need to be able to see that in our lives. They, they see the difference that the presence of the Holy Spirit of God would make in our lives. And so here's the thing. How do we do that? How do we live holy lives? And how can the Spirit of God empower us to live holy lives? Well, three things. Three things that, that we need to have. First of all, we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
We must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5, once again, you're familiar with these verses. Ephesians 5, verse 18. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And, and if you ask yourself the question, well, what does it look like? How, how can I gauge it? How can I get an idea that, that, uh, that, that at this moment in my life or time in my life or, or the way I'm seeking to live my life, how, how can I gauge whether I'm filled with the Holy Spirit or not? And the Bible does a wonderful thing for us because it shows us right here how we can do that. Notice, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And then watch what it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Uh, can I just stop and say this? I, I, one, one good evidence that you're filled with the Spirit is when you talk to yourself. Go ahead and say amen. All right? <laughs> when you talk to yourself. But no, listen, when you talk to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. When during the day you've got, the, you've got thoughts on your mind concerning the things of God. Maybe it's a gospel song that you heard on the radio. Maybe it's even a message that you heard preached on, on Sunday morning or Sunday night. Maybe it's your devotional time that you had in the morning. And boy, you ran across something that just did something for you that day. Like, like it maybe uh, like, uh, better than perhaps other days. And it just there's a Bible verse that just sticks in your mind. And you go through the day. But especially you go through singing, uh, singing hymns and, and spiritual spiritual songs. It goes on since making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those, listen, that, that's the way you can really uh, gauge how much you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Being filled with the Holy Spirit of God doesn't mean that you uh, that you do some you know extreme thing like lay your hands on somebody and they get healed and, and and things like that. You know you might lay your hands on somebody, you might pray for somebody, and God may just heal them. Uh, but that's not that's not of you. That's not anything of us. Uh, that that's of the of the will and the power and, and, and the choosing of God. But you know what, what, what we can do that really shows that we're spirit-filled is that we're living such a life and, and that people look at us and they see a joy about us, not just a happiness, but they see a joy. They see us even in difficult times being able to sing hymns. They see us even in troubled times uh, being able to uh, trust the Lord. Uh, they see us, even when things are hard, uh, they see that it does not get us down. Something is spurring us on, putting a, 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 a new uh, step in our walk and a smile on our face and a joy in our hearts. And, and I just want you to know this evening, dear friend, it's the feeling of the Holy Spirit that does that. And so we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Number two, we must exhibit the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Exhibit the fruit of the Holy Spirit. This is, this is more evidence uh, that, the, uh, uh, that we are living holy lives empowered by the Spirit of God. It's when we exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and verse 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, uh, there is no law. These are the things that people should see in our lives. They should be able to see the love that is in our lives and the joy and the peace and the long-suffering and the gentleness and goodness and faith. They, they, they just see those things in our lives. They give evidence of the Spirit of God in dwelling within us, empowering us to live a holy life for the Lord. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. Number three, we must put to death the deeds of the flesh. Put to death the deeds of the flesh. That's back in our text in Romans chapter number eight, verse 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. The word mortify quite literally means to put to death. 
uh, to do away with, to put to death the deeds of the body, or that is the deeds uh, of the flesh. And he says if you live after that flesh, you die. But if you'll put that flesh to death, then you'll live. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. You remember this? I'll read several verses here. Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. You may want to turn there and follow along with me. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And watch these words now. Mortify. There's that word again. Put to death. Mortify. Therefore your members which are upon the earth. And you say, well, what is that? Well, he tells us. Fornication. Uncleanness. Inordinate affection. Evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, into which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. In other words, these are some of the sins and some of the ways and some of the lifestyles that people lived before they got saved. And Paul is saying that to the people of Colossae here, saying, Now, you used to be like that, but you're not like that anymore. And so he said in verse 8, But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now here, here's the thing. You say, well, if I, I'm, just, I'm still just flesh. I know I've been saved, but I still have this difficulty with, uh, with the flesh. How can I, uh, in the flesh that I am, and, and, and being a sinful creature as I am, how, how can I uh, get rid of these things? How, how can I do it? The thing about it is, you can do it. And I can do it. We can do it. You know, all of these things, whatever it is, is in this list here, even back up in verse number uh, 5, the things that are, are listed there. And then the things are listed in, in uh, verse number 8. You know, you and I, let's be honest with ourselves. Uh, we, we, could, we could keep ourselves from being angry. We could uh, keep ourselves from, from uh, putting wrath on someone. We can sure keep ourselves from blasphemy and filthy uh, communication. We can change the way we talk, amen? Uh, you can do that. We can stop lying. We don't have to lie. Uh, we can put off what we used to do, the places where we used to go, the things that we, uh, that we used to think that we had to have. We can, we can do without those things. You see, the thing about it is, we can sure do that. And one thing about it is, we don't have to do it alone. We have the help of the Holy Spirit, amen, that lives within us. And so we said, well, then how do I do that? Well, the beginning of the chapter in Colossians chapter 3, I think, gives us the greatest, uh, greatest uh, clue at all, uh, of all on how we can do this very thing where it just says, set your affection on things above. Seek those things which are above. Your old life is dead. Your new life is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So just put your heart, your mind, your thoughts, your lifestyle, put your living, put all you, all that you are, put it on Jesus Christ. Amen. And make Jesus and your relationship with Him the focal point of your life. You know, when we do that, uh, when we put to death the deeds of the flesh, uh, like the Apostle Paul, understand, we, and, and as, as he wrote to the Colossians, uh, seek things above. Put your heart, your mind, your thought, your eyes upon the Lord Jesus. It's, isn't that really what it sounds like that the Apostle Paul did himself when he wrote in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 24, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know what Paul is saying there? He's saying, look, I just made up my mind. It's like Joshua in the Old Testament. Choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, uh, we will serve the Lord. I just make up my mind. I'm just going to follow Jesus. Amen? Yeah. That's what it means here. And, and the Holy Spirit. 
is, is what empowers us for that kind of holy living that can be pleasing to God. And so the Holy Spirit gives evidence of salvation. That's what He does. He empowers us for holy living. And then the final thought here, if you'll notice back in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, verse 18, He enables us to endure suffering. Enables us to endure suffering. Verse 17 and verse 18. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know, we sang the song, How Beautiful Heaven Must Be. And we think of that, the glory of heaven and being in, pre in the presence of the Lord, uh, being relieved of this suffering of this earth and being in the Lord's presence. But you know something? You don't have to wait till you get to heaven to know that glory. You notice how it said, the glory which shall be revealed in us. Do you see that? In us. I believe we can have that glory right now. We can have that glory in us. We can endure the suffering. This world is full of suffering. And, and let's be honest with ourselves, it really seems like today that saved people uh, certainly are not immune from the suffering. And often it is Bible-believing Christians that face the greatest difficulties of anybody in the society in the world today. We need the enabling power of the Holy Spirit of God to get us through. Can you say amen to that? Now here's, here's the wonderful thing. The Bible tells us that He, that is the Holy Spirit, the one who makes Jesus real to us, the Holy Spirit is available. Is available right here and right now and for each one of us, no matter what the suffering that we may have to face. Notice with me in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul. When you think about suffering, we think about the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ on the, on the cross, but then uh, apart from His suffering, there is another one that suffered greatly, and that was the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul suffered undoubtedly more than, than, than you or I have ever suffered, but Paul suffered, and here in prison, he writes these words, uh, verse 16 of 2 Timothy chapter 4, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The Apostle Paul, in all the suffering that he suffered with, he says, you know, uh, uh, many men just left me. Those that did stand with me, they, they backed out when the going got rough. They got, they got going. <laughs> they got going out of it. He said there are those, many that uh, would forsook him. In fact, he says, no man stood with me, that they, would all, that they all forsook him. But he says the Lord stood with him. Stood with him in that suffering. Let me ask you this question. How did the Lord stand with him? By the Holy Spirit. And that same Holy Spirit is available today. You and I are living in a time where there is much suffering. And, and if we will be really kind of, I guess, see the reality of things. Uh, doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon. And then not only that, it looks like it could spread. And we would like to think that uh, such suffering as is going on in some places in the world around us today might not would ever hit home to where we're at, but we, we won't know. You'll never know. Uh, suffering can come. You never know what you might have to face tomorrow or next week or, or next month. We're living now in the midst of this pandemic, of this coronavirus, this COVID-19, and, and this world around us is just not 
is just not the same uh, that we've been used to. And there's, there's suffering that, that takes place as a result of it. Many people have lost their jobs. Many people have been sick. Many people in the hospitals. Many people that have died. Uh, this is, this is a, a world that is full of suffering right now. And if it doesn't get better uh, very quickly, uh, the question could come to some people's mind, how are we going to make it? And I'd submit to us this evening, church, Without the Holy Spirit, we may not make it. But with the Holy Spirit, and everyone that has professed faith and confesses faith and has received Jesus Christ as Savior, you have that blessed and wonderful Holy Spirit available to you every moment, every second of every hour of every day, day and night, 24-7. The Spirit of God is ready. And the Spirit of God is available. And the Spirit of God will provide for us is exactly what we need to endure the times of suffering. That's, that's who the Holy Spirit is. That's what He does. I think it's just a marvelous thing. You know, Jesus told His disciples in one place, it's expedient for you that I go away because if I go not away, then the Comforter uh, wouldn't come. I imagine His disciples in that day would be thinking, well, Lord, we can't live without you. you don't go away from us. Don't leave us. But He says, I got to go because if I don't go, the, uh, the Comforter won't come. The Spirit of God won't, won't come. And the Spirit of God didn't come to replace Him. The Spirit of God came to make Him real to hearts and lives. Now think about this. Jesus in the flesh on the earth. The, the, the people that he could comfort, the people that he could help, uh, the people that he could be with would be limited to those that could be physically there near him, right? The Spirit of God now. Now that Jesus ascended to heaven and sent that comforter, sent that Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God is well able to, be, to, to make Jesus real to countless numbers, even millions of people throughout the world, all at the same time. And I don't know about you, but I just think we ought to thank God that he did choose to do things the way he did, Amen. that Jesus would go away for a while with the promise of coming back, but in the meantime, he would not leave us comfortless. He'd come to us by that person of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together, our heads bowed, our eyes closed for prayer. Our Father, we do thank you for the Word of God this evening, and we thank you for the blessed Holy Spirit. And Spirit of God, we recognize you as that third person of the Trinity. We recognize you as God the Spirit, making real to us our Savior, Jesus, God the Son who alone could bring us to a relationship with God the Father. Uh, one God and three persons, an amazing thing. But Lord, we, uh, though we might not always comprehend it fully in our minds, Lord, we thank you that we can believe the truth of the doctrine of the Trinity of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives by faith. Believe the Bible. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've done. And thank you for the Spirit of God, the greatest gift that anyone could ever receive. We pray, Lord, that there will be those in these last days that perhaps have not yet been born again that will trust Christ before it's too late. And that they too would then receive of this blessed Holy Spirit and know what it means to have the peace of God that passeth all understanding that their souls have been saved, their lives changed, and they do have a home in heaven, and that they could live a wonderful life for the glory of God. And Lord, we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Let's sing a song together. Brother Tim, if you got a song for us this, this evening. So glad everyone's able to make it to our evening service uh, tonight. Amen. Brother Tim. Page 86.
Amen.